This is Corin Nemec, live from Neosho, Missouri, and I happen to have a question for you. It's a very serious question. Take a moment here, gather yourself. Do you nerd? That's the question. Do you nerd? Do you nerd? Do you nerd? If we like it, we nerd it. Do you nerd? Yeah, I guess we have the mic. Test, yeah, test, you check, you check, you check, you check, you check, check. And I can, I can turn them up if you, you know, don't feel like. Oh, I think I. I'm, can yeah, everybody hear me pretty well? This is my yeah. first well, podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're so far away. I know. You get it closer. You, you <laughs> closer. Oh, it's all right. It's be like a like Steve and Joe. It's fine. No, I make sure my phone is off. I got it. Got it. Off, so I, I, I kind of like to go rock and roll with it. <laughs> we got some Stargate fans out there. <laughs> Smallville fans out there? Woo! Yes. <laughs> Some Supernatural. 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 Woo! Parker Lewis. I was going to say Parker Lewis. Parker, Parker Lewis. Lewis. <laughs> Parker Lewis. Parker Lewis. Parker Lewis. Parker Stan. Some fans. Harold Lauder right here. <laughs> Harold Lauder. Want uh, me to be a man? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you're learning how to be a man from Harold Lauder, you are in. <laughs> you are in for a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> you are in for a surprise. There was not an ounce of man in Harold Lauder. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell that to Harold. Uh, Nadine was far more manly and masculine than Harold Lauder was. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, you guys are excited for Corin here. Corin, are you excited to be in the show in Arkansas? I am. I am. I, I you know, I'm a... Uh, I actually I used to have property on Beaver Lake, which isn't that far from here, uh, but uh, in North Arkansas. Unfortunately, I, I well, fortunately, I sold it because it had tripled in price in five years, which I was absolutely shocked by. Uh, this is back in the 90s. It, uh, apparently, I guess Beaver Lake just out of nowhere became the, the to-do spot to build your, uh, you know, your swanky home. Uh, and uh, and so, unfortunately, I did sell it back in the '90s. I really wanted to hang on to it, but I just I didn't know when I was ever going to build on it, if I was ever going to build on it. Well, what happens if Beaver Lake stays in Beaver Lake? <laughs> that's true. That's true. It's a very deep lake. In, in fact, I don't know if anybody is familiar with this, but the but some crazy rich guy sunk a small pyramid down in the lake, and you can go diving to it. It's mm -hmm. a little diving spot. The, does, deep, the lake's deep enough to dive in. Does it have a ring gate? It should. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? That would be really awesome. What was your favorite part about, because you came into uh, Stargate SG-1 kind of in the middle, right? Well, uh, the end of, I, my, my very first episode was the second or, or last episode of season five. Well, uh, and then I came on as a series regular in season six. As uh, Jonas Quinn, what was your favorite part about being the character, about taking this role on? Um, well, it, it, my favorite part was eating. <laughs> <laughs> but then the, uh, the producers, um, about halfway through the season, they, uh, there was a scene, and it was kind of a, a faux pas on my part, but uh, <laughs> there was a scene up in, the, in the, um, the conference room that overlooks the Stargate and everything, and there was this big, long scene. I think it was maybe six pages or something. I had one line. It's a really important, you know, like end of the world scene kind of thing, you know. And, it's a treasure map. And and I and I didn't have I I, I was standing uh, where they had placed me, and the scene was right by the table where they have like the coffee and the, the and the snacks and all of the stuff for the for you know uh, the set. And so I decided, oh, I'll just be peeling an orange while all this six page scene is going on. <laughs> and when it gets to my line, I'll take a bite of the orange and say my line or whatever. You know, so. I, I did this, and never, nobody said a word. Everything was fine. Nobody told me not to do it, whatever. But when they got into the editing room, every time they were cutting to a shot that I was in, you just see me back there peeling this <laughs> bright, this, excuse my French, uh, peeling this really bright orange. And it took, and all you could do is just stand. What is he doing? And you took, it took you completely out of the scene. And so they're trying to figure out how to edit around my eating this freaking orange that's so distracting. And they weren't very happy about that. And after that, 
they 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 said I got a note from the uh, from the writers and the producers that said if it's not in the script you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, ouch! That's a harsh ouch. note. Ouch! Yeah, that's the harshest note you've that ever had. That was the yeah. That was the that that actually is the harshest note that I've ever had. Uh, and you know, but I I think that it was a little extreme to be honest because I I really felt that that that. Uh, that you know the the playfulness of the characters dealing with new stuff and that because that's what uh, um, for me Jonas Quinn the first that you know when you go to a different planet one of the first things that you're going to ha have to be to confront is the cuisine mm -hmm. you know it's just like when you go traveling to a different country you know if you go to Thailand and you don't like Thai food you are in the wrong place <laughs> you know so it was kind of like you know it was the excitement of, of Jonas being in this new world with this new you know new foods and new things and stuff and so I was constantly trying to kind of marry that into the you know into my scenes and everything which I thought I thought worked really well up until the orange <laughs> <laughs> The orange Orm. debacle. Well, what insight to, to Jonas? I don't know what questions people might have about the character that they always just wanted to know. That you know, some sort of insight about the character that you might have come up with when playing the role to, to yeah. bring them to life. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think that uh, that the writers did such a great job uh, introducing the character and then segueing the character into the team without you know forcing uh, forcing the character onto uh, onto the audience or onto the other uh, team members. Um, so I think that they I think that they did a great job with the, with their creation of the character and I, I just plugged myself into it. You just did you know. what you do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was uh, uh, really, really, um, unfortunately I didn't have, uh, I didn't have to do all of the, the uh, doctor babble like uh, Amanda Carter does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, she, I mean, my gosh. Some, in, in fact, it's funny because uh, when there were scenes with Rick, if if he ever had any of that kind of babble, he would go give it give, give this line to Amanda, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he would just give it to Amanda, and she's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rick was Rick, Rick was notorious for uh, for not saying what was on the the script, so you you know you really had to because sometimes he would say something and your your dialogue wouldn't match what he said, so you have to really be on your toes. Uh, working with him because at any given moment you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so you just you know you always had to be ready. He didn't get the note about what if it's on the script. You got to do the script. You, Rick doesn't get notes. He gives notes. Oh. In fact, I think, I, I, I think he might have been the culprit behind the orange uh, <laughs> the orange letter. Uh, uh, he, he he definitely uh, apparently he definitely was not happy about the orange. In the scene, <laughs> and I think that the note probably came, came from him. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a great time working together. I mean, I got, I get along with uh, uh, I get along with everyone pretty well as it is, and and uh, what a great uh, what a great cast uh, to work with. Don Davis was fantastic. May he rest in peace. Just uh, uh, you know, a life lost uh, way too soon. But um, uh, he, me and him got along really well because uh, we're both. Southern boys, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's down here in Joplin, Southern Missouri, and I'm, I'm from Arkansas, and, and we had a, uh, a real bond because of that, and, uh, and hung out quite a bit. And he's an amazing painter, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm interested in, in, in painting and, and photography and art and stuff like that, so uh, I was uh, at his house quite a bit uh, when, you know, checking out his paintings and hanging out and having a chat, and what a great guy, I mean, what a, what a stellar, stellar fellow. Absolutely. Well, working on Stargate, and people get the, the, <coughs> these questions, and this is something that's interesting to me. Did you get to take home any toys? <laughs> well, you know, they, the the writing uh, the writing off of the character was a was a real surprise. They didn't, uh, you know, uh, they didn't tell me that they were going to do that uh, until way after we when we finished season six, and they're they're picking up season seven. And for some reason, my contract wasn't coming through. And I'm like, what's the problem, guys? Is there an issue with, you know, what's going on? I'm, I'm getting nervous here. We're, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're coming up on, uh, uh, on a few months after the show had finished. And, and then they, that's when they called and they said, well, the network wants to bring Michael Shanks back. 
and I was just devastated. Well, I mean, why don't you don't do that? I was just, and then and then they said, uh, you know, then, then they go, would you like your character to live or die? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna wager on the side of living just in case I can get back into another episode after the third one. And I was really, I, you know, to be honest, I mean, you know, to be brutal honest, I was really shocked that they never brought Jonas back. Mm -hmm. After uh, after that last episode, uh, and I mean, I was just uh, and 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 that you know they had movies that they did where they're talking about Kelowna and his planet, and they're out there and they're all this, and then I, I'm, I'm like. What am I chopped liver? It was really, I felt, you know, because I, you know, I, I, I always keep a really great attitude on yeah. set. I didn't, uh, you know, when they wrote me off, off, off the, the show, I didn't go in there with a bad attitude. I didn't go in there with a chip on my shoulder. I went in there and, and uh, you know, and, and, and had a good time like I always do with everybody. And, uh, and I, it, it definitely was a, was, was a shock that they, that they just, like, didn't ever bring that character back after that. And I think at one point in one of the movies or something, my planet blows up. And I think that one of them actually makes a comment, wasn't that Jonas's planet? <laughs> or something like that. Like they make some kind of loose comment. I didn't see it, but I was told about it. Like, oh yeah, yeah, they mentioned you. I was like, well, that was nice of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, living or dying, uh, the character living or dying doesn't necessarily matter when you switch from sci-fi to the supernatural. Well, yes, yes, that's true, yeah. Uh, so what was your experience like just getting into that show and then playing, the, well, super, playing this different genre? Yeah, Supernatural. I mean, it's, you know, I like, I, like, I like playing edgy characters, characters with a little bit of oomph to them, you know. Uh, um, and uh, they, the role, actually, that we were supposed to do ten or more episodes uh, for that storyline, the storyline of, uh, of, of the family. And apparently that season there was just so much going on uh, storyline wise introducing this new storyline was becoming problematic for the writers to figure out well how do we track with everything else that's going on we have to focus on what we've already established and tell those stories and you know this is, is so especially in a show with 48 so seasons. yeah yeah <laughs> so oddly enough you know that that that, <laughs> that character got written out early too which was uh, which was also a shame because I you know they they said anywhere from eight to, to ten episodes was what we were supposed to shoot, and I was very excited about that. And I think we I think we only did five or four four or six maybe, not not very quality many. not quantity. But yeah yeah it was yeah it was uh, you know because to 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 do such a big setup with the family and with those characters and then to just it yeah. just then just to write it off and go oh we don't have time for this and then write off you're like. So when you're watching, you're like, well, that was, uh, that was uneventful. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hey, you made it eventful. Don't worry about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. People love well, people I, I survived the longest of my, uh, of my siblings, of my other, you know, my other family members. I, they, they definitely let me at least hang in there the longest. Well, it's, well that's, we, everyone's happy about that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, I mean, okay. We're in a sci-fi event, right? Sci-fi, supernatural, the cool For stuff. Sure. The cool stuff that mm -hmm. everybody loves because it's the best stuff. But you've done a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, writer, producer, acting, uh, all around, just cool dude. Thank That's you. what people are saying. <laughs> <laughs> What's your uh, favorite thing that these folks might want to know about that you've done so far? Oh, gosh. Um, Artcon 2020? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you mean you mean in terms of uh, the, the the body of work or uh, but yeah, but well, don't go through the entire no, history. No, no, no. Oh God, no. Like One uh, projects. And yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know the, the 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 cool stuff, the cool kid stuff, the sci-fi. Yeah. The yeah, I I mean <clears throat> one of, well one of my all-time favorite projects that I ever uh, that I ever got to work on uh, on the in the sci-fi genre was a movie called Solar Crisis. Which flopped horribly. It was a uh, we, we shot it in 1989, and it was like a 48 million dollar budget, which in 1989 That's is like a hundred million dollar yeah. budget today. You know, I mean, it was just huge, 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 huge budget, and uh, it was with uh, Charlton Heston was played my grandfather in that, and Tim Matheson played my dad in that. Uh, Peter Boyle was uh, also in that film. Jack Palance mm -hmm. uh, was uh, was my co-star in that. We had a, a, our our storyline took place together. 
and uh, working with some great. That's what I mean. I mean, you know, what an incredible. Uh, uh, Richard Serafian uh, directed that. Richard Serafian was uh, uh, he was most well known for a movie called Vanishing Point that he directed. That was this crazy like cha car chase movie mm -hmm. uh, that was done back in the seventies. It was a huge hit and. Um, Oddly enough, he didn't have quite the career that I, I was expecting uh, Richard Serafian to have. He was, he was kind of a, a Francis Ford Coppola type of dude, you know, um, very artsy and uh, a great guy. Uh, but that, yeah, that that movie was, uh, you know, you can find it. It's called Solar Crisis. It's it's out there somewhere. It can it can be found. Um, and it just oddly enough, I you know they they um, because it was a Japanese. Film production, mm -hmm. and it, but we were shooting it in America. That I think that they had a real hard time with the distribution and stuff. I think somebody had it out for them uh, because it's conspiracy. I, it, it had it, it, there was something odd because it it had the worst distribution in the U.S. that you could possibly get for a film of that of that size, mm -hmm. you know, and that budget and that quality with those actors. And, I mean, it just absolute dismal distribution, and no, no, no uh, publicity for it. But in Japan, it was huge. You're big in Japan. Uh, I was at the time. I was at the time. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, I flew over there for the premiere, and we did a big, you know, like kind of, kind of a, a publicity tour. And I mean, Japan, what a what a country. Uh, if if you have a chance to go anywhere. And if you're going to save up, some, Japan is the place is the place to go. That is one of the coolest countries ever. Uh, they implement technology very quickly and efficiently there. So you know when you know whereas here in here in the U.S., you know if you come up with something very inventive that's going to help, it's going to go on the back burner for at least ten years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they don't want. They're like, no, 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 no. We're good with the slow stuff yeah, first. Yeah. It's, it's, you know. Uh, so they, they, they do the opposite though. When they have something that makes stuff more efficient and work better, they, they put it right in uh, pretty much right away. So back in the, in, the, in the late 90s, it was like the year 2020 it already in, J in Japan. I mean, it was, I was just blown away by you know, the, the way that everything operated there. Very, very uh, uh, savvy and they have beer vending machines on the street. <laughs> when I was, uh, when I, was yeah, I was 17 at the time, which is not legal drinking age in America, obviously, or pretty much anywhere else in the world. But uh, for some reason, they, they really didn't give a crap how old I was over there. Um, you just drink beer. But I was walking down the street. I was like, that's so weird that they're advertising Sapporo and Asahi on... Coke machines. <laughs> and then I look and I go, well, that's even stranger that they that they have the buttons with the beer on them, too. And not, in fact, I bet that this is, and so I did. I looked around and I was like, <laughs> took some yen, took a yen out, you know, dropped it in there. You know, it was the, it was like a classic Coke commercial, you know. It went in and made that little, like, and then hit it, it was a, comes out. I pulled it up. <laughs> a little mist goes traveling off, wafting with the wind. And I'm looking around like, whoa, it's real. Nobody cares! <laughs> <laughs> well, like in the words of Yakov Smirnoff, as you quoted earlier, what a country. Yes, yeah, yes. And uh, what, uh, unfortunately for me, that was like on day three that I discovered these beer vending machines. So you can imagine the next 20 days that I was there, I was like, yeah. <laughs> My mom was like, stop that, you're not old enough. <laughs> tell that to the machine. Yeah, <laughs> tell that to the machine, it's not parting me. Uh, but but they, they told me it's really, that they, they do that because everybody's so hungover in Japan that they need beer vending machines because you'll see, you'll literally see people, instead of coffee, they're like slamming a freaking beer on the subway <laughs> at 8 a.m. You know, on their way to work. They're like, oh. <laughs> but the, yeah, the drinking culture there is, it's, it's like Ireland. In fact, oh, that, that's, I'll share this other cool story with you too since we're on it. I know you guys probably want to talk about some acting stuff, but this is a great story. I was, uh, so by the time I was, that was there for like three weeks and I was kind of like, I need something Americana. I need to feel like something a little more, you're something different than this. And, and I was told that there was a, an Irish, uh, Irish pub in this area called Ginza District, which is kind of a, a fancy restaurant uh, shopping area. And it was on the third floor of a high rise. And I'm like, 
that doesn't sound very Irish pub to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, great, the, the, the Japanese version of the Irish pub. Like, Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. So I, I set out to go. I'm like, I got to go. I mean, I have to have something a little different here. So I get up there and I get, I get off the elevator and I look down this long hallway and there's this tiny little wooden door, like really old looking, just, you know, just sitting there. Just, and I was like, that's weird. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, it was, and, and now I'll tell you the backstory. Oops. Uh, the backstory is the, the guy who owned the building, you know, filthy, filthy rich uh, uh, real estate mogul, had gone to Ireland on vacation with his family and stayed in this tiny little village. And the village pub, he fell in love with it. And he bought the, 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 this 600 year old Irish pub. Had it completely dismantled. I'm sure the locals were absolutely yeah. furious about this. <laughs> They're taking a pub. I mean, they probably had to do it in the dead of night in Ireland. You know, you can't go and steal an Irish pub <laughs> from, you know, from the Irish. And so this, yeah, this 600 year old pub had it completely dismantled and then rebuilt inside of his building so he could go to it anytime he wanted. So you walk down this hall and you open up this tiny little door and you walk in and it's just full of Japanese people just drunk as an Irishman. <laughs> I mean, just completely liquored up in a 600 year old Irish pub. That was and, teleported there basically. And it was just the coolest thing ever. I was like, wow, now this is awesome. And uh, ended up having, you know, having a great night there with, with all these all these Japanese people. So the number one destination is an Irish pub. It is the place to go. If you, if you do end up in Tokyo, you got to go find this 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 uh, this place. It, it was fantastic. It's right next to Narnia. <laughs> exactly. Well, I can be ta I can ask you questions uh, all day, but you want to talk does to anybody? Well, people? does anybody have a a, a, a question? A, a burning question? It's got to be burning, though. It's got to be burning. Actually, I was wondering, though, like, because when I watched Supernatural, I, you know, I saw the first Stargate actor, and, like, and, didn't, and then another one, another. How did that, like, do you know how that trend started? Like, let's get all these ex-Stargate actors Well, they, it, they both shoot in Vancouver. Both of those shows shoot in Vancouver. And uh, there's there's a lot of crossover, you know, because of that. A lot of the directors will do will, will, will you'll, you'll, if you don't if you pay attention to who's directing a lot of the episodes, you'll actually find that that they, there's a crossover there too. You'll see that some directors are doing some Stargate, they're doing some Supernatural, and they're doing this and that. And you'll see that these directors kind of move around, and on, those directors will also sometimes cast people that they've worked with on other shows too. And it, it makes sense to do those kind of crossover. Uh, you know, characters and stuff like that. I think that you know, for the genre, I have found that there is a huge crossover between Supernatural and Stargate in the, in the fandom world. Uh, I've I've noticed it doing these conventions. Uh, you know, it, they, most of the people who are into Supernatural are also into Stargate and vice versa. You know, and you are not that far from Carthage, Missouri now. And I am not that far from Carthage. That is true. Yeah, which is featured in two episodes of Supernatural. Gotcha. <laughs> I don't know if they just like threw a dart, like why they picked Carthage. You know, it's it's possible. Well, that's how they that's how they came up with the planet names on on uh, uh, on Stargate. Was uh, they would they had a big map of Canada, and there's so many weird names in Canada. They would just go <laughs> and they just point and they go, "What do you got, Kelowna?" Perfect. <laughs> Kelowna is a small town that's just outside of Vancouver, you know, about an hour drive from Vancouver. Or so. so, but that is that's actually how they did it in Stargate. Uh, you know, we need another we need another planet name. All right, Saskatchewan. No, no, no. People, too many people know that one. <laughs> we got some more burning questions out there. Yeah. I'll, I'll go here and then there. How about that? Okay. Um, whenever you uh, joined Stargate, it was uh, uh, like we, like what was just uh, said, it was right in the middle of the series, or what ended up being the middle of the series. And uh, what I'm sort of wondering is that you took over for Michael Shanks, yep. essentially, and uh, uh, Jonas Quinn kind of always felt like he really didn't belong necessarily and always kind of held like he had something to prove. And sure. Especially with um, 
uh, the show moving from Showtime to Sci-Fi. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering if you kind of felt like Jonas, like you had something to prove as an actor in Stargate with all of these guys as I well. And if so, did that kind of help you play Jonas? Um, I guess so. I mean, there, there were certainly real parallels between, you know, coming on a, coming on a show as an actor that that everybody's already been on for a long time, and especially replacing a character that was so well loved and mm -hmm. and received by the uh, by the fans of the show. Uh, it, it definitely when I when I got the job, I was super excited. I didn't realize just. I didn't have Showtime, so I had never actually watched the series, but I was a huge fan of the original movie that it was based on, the Stargate movie. Mm -hmm. And I was just stoked. I didn't realize just how the fan, how, how serious people <laughs> took the show. I, didn't, I had no clue about con conventions and sci-fi and all of that. I didn't, have a, I didn't have a clue. I'd never been to a convention in my life until after Stargate. I was like, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I come to find out that, you know, that people were very upset that Michael Shanks had bad, left the mm -hmm. show. And they were not happy at all that Jonas Quinn had come on there. And apparently there was, they, they kept a lot of that, that information away from me because they didn't want me to feel all like, oh God, people don't like me? <laughs> but apparently, you know, it, but it's always the vociferous few, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, but it was funny because they, they were getting such huge backlash. I think that's partly why they, you know, in the, in, as the show, before my, before my episodes even started airing, they were getting just huge backlash from the fans. We want Michael, that's not fair, okay, blah, blah, blah. And he wanted to leave the show. You know what I mean? It wasn't like they forced him out. Uh, you know, he wanted to leave. And yeah, so, uh, so um, uh, what, what ended up happening is that, that uh, that they get, so there was this big backlash. There, so I, I figured that they were that they were leaning towards trying to get Michael back. I, I, I kind of like could see a little bit of the writing on the wall there, but I had high hopes uh, uh, that they wouldn't. Um, and then oddly enough, when they did bring Michael back, they suddenly got the opposite. Now suddenly people were like all the people who had invested themselves in Jonas and were like, oh yeah, actually you know what. I love this character. This is great. He's awesome. And then they got rid of him. People were like, "Hey, <laughs> what the hell?" You know. So, so it ended up a little bit of the reverse happened, and I think they were like, "Oh, what? I, oh it's too late now. Sorry." You know. They could have uh, given you a little mention. They could have brought you back. Yeah. I think writing in a campaign, I, you guys. I, 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 you know, I, I would love to. Uh, I would love to to do the uh, to do the show uh, again if they brought it back. Uh, I would love to. You know. If yeah, people yeah. want the Game of Thrones season eight redone, we can get Stargate. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Game of Thrones that last season was that was just <laughs> that was so the the final episode. What a what a let, I mean what a letdown that they that, that you you have this whole build up with these with these the, these uh, these dark you know zombie like creatures and they're they're going to be the end of the world all that and they just like kick their ass and it's gone and it's over and then they're back. I'm like. Wait a second! <laughs> this was like the, the everything was being leading up to this. I thought that they were going to end up going to King's Landing. I thought that there was, you know, like they, they, everybody was going to have to come together finally, and they just kill them off, and then they go back. And I'm like, that was. They should have brought you in. Corn is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, from what I heard, that, that you know, because he, he was still trying to write the book while yeah. they were doing yeah. the series. He still has a. He still hasn't written the last two completely right. yet. Yeah, so I think I think that that probably was part partly why it was a little disjointed and weird because they were probably breathing down his neck, you know, to uh, to get that done uh, in time. But what a great show! I love <coughs> the show. Sir, you got a question over here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle that you have to overcome when shooting uh, from Smallville to Supernatural to Stargate? What's your, what do you feel your biggest obstacle is? The downtime in between. <laughs> you know, the, uh, I, I, I made a, um, a decision to, to move, uh, when, I got, when I got married and I had kids and stuff, I made a decision to move to Texas because I didn't want uh, to raise my kids in Los Angeles, to be perfectly honest. I grew up there and I was like, there's no way my daughter is, is going to these schools. You know what I mean? It's wild out there. I mean, it's, it, is a, it is a strange land, uh, you know, because it's really, like they say, the village, it's really the village that raises the children, you know, after a while. And if your village is 
Sodom and Gomorrah, you, well, your kids are probably going to come out a little Sodom and Gomorrah-ish. No <laughs> wonder they're learning to drive in that traffic. <laughs> so, I, and, and it was definitely the right move, being, in, being outside of Houston in Spring, Texas. It's like, you know, it still has that kind of like atomic era hangover, you know what I mean? Where it's like, where family's actually important and people do go to church and they're not you know, looked down, uh, frowned upon for doing so, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, um, and it really paid off. Uh, my, my, my marriage didn't last, uh, but I ended up staying in Texas as well so I could be a, you know, a permanent fixture as a, as a father in, in my kids' lives. Uh, wh but it, it, took a, it took a huge toll on my career not being in Los Angeles over these, uh, these years. Um, a re it's really tough. That's the hardest part is not is not being around the industry. I have to, you know, the only thing that's kept me working is my relationships that I've made with producers and directors. Uh, my agent and manager, they're almost useless, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I've uh, the in the last in the last five six years, I've pretty much gotten all of my jobs myself. Uh, either I'm producing and acting in it, or uh, you know, or it's with a relationship with somebody that I've worked with a bunch or whatever. And but it is, and nothing is paying like it used to either. That's that's for, that's probably the, the the hardest is go is when you you're, you're going from here and then you're like, wait a second, I'm doing the exact same work, but it's like you, they they just it, it's a feast or famine now in in Hollywood. It's really strange. Uh, you either are you're either getting paid the absolute bare minimum, or you're getting paid a fortune. And there's hardly there used to be a really great in between, you know. There was a you know, but they, they uh, our union Screen Actors Guild um, they came up with these new contracts for these these modified low budget projects, um, and unfortunately they they really they really screwed us because it now behooves the producers to not spend money. On the films, in order to get these these contracts where they can pay you garbage rates, which they didn't used to be able to do that because SAG uh, forced them to raise more money because you're not going to pay our actors, you know, what you're trying to pay them, and so I don't know why they did it, but they they went ahead and made this deal to oh yeah now you can do so it it behooves the producers to do a movie for under five hundred thousand instead of raising you know eight hundred thousand or whatever you know because they get these these contracts and, and then you're, you're kind of screwed, you know, because of it. Whereas before, it, the producers were forced to go and raise more money because they, they couldn't get union actors, you know, uh, to, do their, to do their jobs. So uh, that's, been, that's been really tough as well. That's been really tough. So it's been, it's definitely been um, uh, a, a financial roller coaster, <laughs> you know what I mean? You start a YouTube channel. It's, uh, you know, I've I've thought of it. I've you know people pitched pitched that to me and stuff, and I, I just don't. It's like, what what would my you got to have a shtick? You know what I mean? You have to have a, a point of view, a topic, or something. And you know, I just don't. I, I couldn't see myself commenting on other people's performances or other people's acting or other people's choices. I just didn't, I felt really uncomfortable doing that. And I'm like, and I would also look really strange if all I was doing was commenting on my own act, which I was like, I would, I could do that. I could like do a scene breakdown for somebody, you know, like let's watch this scene from the stand and yeah. you know, oh, this is why I chose to do that or that. And you know what I mean? I mean, I could, I could see, you know, doing that and that could be, you know, kind of interesting and stuff. But, uh, but at the end of the day, man, I just, I want to be a freaking actor. I don't want to. I don't want to be a personality. I don't want to have to, mm -hmm. you know, and that's been another thing that's tough, too, is that I don't sell myself. Yeah. I'm not like, you know, I'm not like on my own soapbox all the time. Like, ah, you know, me, 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 me. And, you know, you, there's an element of, of that that you have to embrace in, in Hollywood, in, in, uh, in acting and in, in arts and entertainment in general. You have to market and sell yourself to a certain degree. And I'm just horrible at it. I don't do it, and uh, I never liked doing um, the talk shows when I was younger. When I was really on the rise, I probably I could have I could have uh, really really taken the reins there and done a lot more publicity and been a lot of talk. But I didn't. The format of the talk shows when I was doing them, they would do these pre-interviews. So you do the interview, and then they and they direct your interview. They're like, well. 
Maybe you could come up with something funny to say. We need an anecdote. They're very, they're very um, uh, contrived, all of those late night talk show interviews. Not, not one of them is organic, I can guarantee you. They're all pre, uh, pre-thought out. The questions are already asked. The answers are already known. And they, and they, and they, they, they direct your, your interview, basically. And I was like, <laughs> but I was like, I was like, this is ridiculous. I was like, if they want to ask me questions, then just put me on the show and ask me questions, and I'll answer them. I don't want to, I don't want to come up with a shtick for you. You know what I mean? Like, I thought you, were, I thought you were trying to get to know me or whatever. And so I was like, look, if they want a pre-interview, I tell them I'm not going to do it. And it was, it was kind of, I guess I was being a little bit of a jerk, you know, in a way. But I was like, you know what? If they want to interview, tell them to interview me. Back then, you had the hair and to pull it off, man. You could do and, it for it. Well, you know, and and so and so they didn't they didn't want to interview me. <laughs> that's that's pretty much how that went. Uh, and. Um, uh, which I was also okay with, because like I said, it's like I just want to, I just want to be on set. I want to act. I want to do my thing, and uh, you know all the hoopla that goes with it can, you know, it's fine. But it's not that I was seeking that out. You know, some people they really seek out the, the you know, the fame and, and you know, the picks and pans and all that. And, and it, it is important because, you know, the 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 more that you're seen, you know, in those in those magazines and the trades and all of that stuff. And the more your popularity, you know, rises, and the more your popularity rises, the more, you know, gigs you're going to get, and all of that. And so, uh, I, I see the logic in it. It's just, you know, well, it's moved a lot more so uh, nowadays, especially with things have changed so many, so much over the years. Where, you know, you have a skill, and you just want to do use that skill that yeah. you have. But now, well, you have to do it then, but you have to do it now. You're, you're selling your personality so you can get permission. To do the thing yeah, it's we it's and and with so there's so many networks now. There's so many shows on. There's so many, and I sit back and I'm like, how am I not on at least one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I've been I've been in the industry since 1986. I have over a hundred credits. I've been on some great shows. I got a I got a you know a, a foothold in you know uh, in 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 the world market, so to speak. You know, people are familiar with me. Uh, you know, and I just look and I'm like. What are my agent and manager doing? What are they not doing? It's just, I sit back, I'm like, there is a thousand shows on television today, and I'm not in one of them. <laughs> but, uh, so well, I know a lot of people watch you on the Orville. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Your name was popping yes. up. Well, unfortunately, they didn't, uh, well, uh, I had auditioned for the Orville last year, and I don't think it was the right role character for me. And then, uh, but then they sent me another audition, and it was for a character named Admiral Corin. And I was like, "Are they?" It was, but it was spelled K O R E N. And I was like, "Are they? Why are they? Are they hamming me in? Are they, <laughs> <laughs> is this? Uh, you know?" Maybe it's a placeholder. And, name. Well, so so I I was on location actually. I was filming a a, a, a a Lifetime movie in Florida when I had to do this when I had to record the audition for it. And I was having some technical issues, and um, so I submitted it, and I didn't hear anything. And I was like, well, that's really weird. Why didn't I? I mean, they named the freaking character after me. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can't believe I'm not getting this job. I was just, I was dumbfounded. And I went, let me go back and watch it. And so I went back and watched it, and the sound was complete. Oh. It had done something to the sound uh, when, I, when I did the transfer from my edit or whatever, and it was just this... You couldn't even understand it. It was weird. It was like this weird, echoey background. And I was like, oh, you're kidding me. I was like, well, I can't resubmit it now. They're already shooting the episode. That would seem very psychotic if I was like, oh, wait, 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 guys. Give it another shot. They're like, yeah, well, we've already shot that episode here. A little late. We got Admiral Andy uh, Dick. <laughs> oh, Andy Dick, he's hilarious. What a character. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I don't know him well, but we've we've hung out a few times over the years. Like nobody knows him well. It, I don't even think he knows him himself well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a character! Should we ask some more questions here? Anyone? No. Oh, oh, sorry. Well, she's, she's back been, here. She's been, been oh, okay. The blue. And then we'll come. Then we'll come from. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't see you back. I kind of had two different questions, okay. and I don't know which one is most relevant. So I'll throw them both, and you can kind sure. of decide. Um, one, you mentioned Hollywood, and I've noticed <coughs> a large trend to things being produced out of Atlanta. 
it seems to be kind of the new Hollywood, mm -hmm. and I didn't know how the migration it's just tax is. Just tax-free rebates. Is it's that just, what it is? It's, it's the it's what it's the value of the buck that they can get there, and, and the uh, the state um, the state matches certain uh, a certain amount of your budget and all of that, and yeah, the incentives are, are, are what's driving that one hundred percent. It's not the humidity. It, no, it's, uh, <laughs> well, Atlanta. That's definitely. Uh, I, I lived in Atlanta for a little bit when I was a kid. I I, I really liked it there. And then um, the, the, the other question had to do with, as an actor and a director, with all the change into green screens and CGI and not so much acting within the set, but acting within a, <coughs> almost a mental environment. Right. How does that change the whole sphere of acting and directing? Um, I, you know, they, they, it doesn't change it too much. I mean, there's technical aspects of it that you, you know, that you obviously have to be aware of, uh, it, you know, if you're directing something with a lot of... Of, of special effects and stuff, you know. You, the, I don't know a lot about that. I would, I would have. To, I haven't directed much that has any green screen or special effects stuff like that. I haven't really directed anything like that. Uh, so, uh, but I understand it being on set enough and being in all these. If I had to, I would really, I would get, I would get it. You know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make it more difficult for me uh, as a director to. Um, to do something that's, in fact, it would be a lot of fun. I, I have a, um, I did a, um, a, uh, an animated pilot uh, with David Faustino, who's a, a good friend of mine, uh, Bud Bunny on Married with Children, <laughs> and we did a, uh, an animated um, uh, show called uh, uh, Hollywood, which is uh, uh, spelled W O U L D, so Hollywood instead of Hollywood, and 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 it's it's very. I, I'm hoping that it will sell. Uh, we, we shot a bunch of, uh, of, of kind of like webisode style episodes for it, and they haven't put it out yet, and it's really hilarious. But we're play, we play uh, everybody. It's it's a show about Hollywood, um, and, but everybody has fruits, nuts, and vegetables. <laughs> so uh, all, there's no there's no people in the in, in it. It's all you know. Uh, so we play two peanuts, <laughs> <laughs> writer writer producers who are trying to you know succeed in Hollywood and 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 make make something happen. And there's a lot of spoofs on other movies and stuff, and you know that kind of thing. And it was it's very very funny. I'm I'm hoping. I think the reason why it it, it hasn't been because that they they've gone back to Comedy Central and to Adult Swim. Like three or four times, they keep bringing them back to talk about it. And I really think the problem is, is that we're in, we're in such a, a, a weird place with comedy nowadays. You know, people are. It seems like people are grossly offended, or at least a small vociferous group love to be grossly offended and make a big deal out of things. You know, on online. You know what's funny? I, I was we were talking about this the other day. It's like. You know, they will make choices about you know whether to put a movie out or not put a movie out or whatever because of something that happens on Twitter, and only two percent of the U.S. population is on Twitter. What on earth are you basing <laughs> your choices off two percent of a, of a bunch of loudmouths, you know, <laughs> on Twitter? And now you're going to cancel a show, or you're going to do something, or you're going to fire somebody, or you're going to make some radical decision? Based on two percent of the population, I'm like, get out of here with that. <laughs> Hashtags just have a lot of power. Yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's 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 crazy though. I don't I don't get. It's like you know, inside that bubble, it's like, oh, that's the, in that in that echo chamber. That's all that exists. I'm like, uh, my, and my you know, my friends, you know, because I, I lived in L.A. for so long, and uh, and our, um, uh, you know, my politics have never changed in terms of what my point of view is, and, and never. But man, have I gotten a backlash for it these days? <laughs> you know, I mean, woo! My, uh, I, I have because a, 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 I don't, I don't talk about my politics with anybody. You know, really, and uh, especially when I know if I'm if I'm on an opposite side of the spectrum from somebody. And, and what I've noticed is that uh, the people with 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 the different views that I have seem to get really angry really quick for some reason, and you can't even have. A conversation of anymore about uh, mm -hmm. about you know politics or whatever. It's like it goes from zero to a hundred immediately. It's and you know and it and I, and I try to stay very loose you know with with, with all of that and fluid. And I and I but I man, whoo! I have noticed some friends back in L.A. Boy, they get I mean <laughs> they get heated immediately. Well, trust me. I mean immediately. I'm like <laughs> immediately. 
can, can, can we work up to it? <laughs> you know, a little bit. Hey, well, the same stuff but happens if you just have a different point of view on the latest Star Trek episode mm. from Leia. So it's all it's all mm. over the place. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. It's wild times. Wild times. <laughs> Exciting times. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty blown away with, with, with what's, what's going on in America today. I'm like, well, oh, I thought that I thought that we weren't a banana republic, <laughs> but apparently they like to behave like we are in certain offices. <laughs> hey, banana republic has nice sweaters. <laughs> they do they have nice sweaters. They do. But they, well, yeah, it's 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 uh, you know. Um, so I, I I I actually enjoy living outside of LA for numerous reasons. You know. Go outside and enjoy the sky once in a while. Yeah. Is, is nice. I moved out from LA and I'm out in this part of the country now, yeah. so I understand it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then okay, so th this gentleman back here, and then I'll go to you, and then I'll come over here. Um, besides solar crisis, what other work, like whether you directed it, produced it, or acted in, has kind of gone under the radar that you're kind of surprised and. O Operation Dumbo Drop, for oh, sure. So Oops. Oh, Operation oh, Dumbo Drop was, that. you know, and, and it was because they, they messed up on the marketing uh, on that. That's really why that movie flopped. Um, it, it, uh, it, plus, it was a comedy about Vietnam, and some people don't find Vietnam very funny. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it was, uh, and it was based on a true story. It was a great, great, you know, uh, great Disney film. Great, fantastic family, you know, family friendly, wonderful cast. Great Disney film. Uh, we, you know, had a huge budget. We shot in Thailand. For, I was over there for almost five and a half months, you know, and, and then we, we still shot a couple of weeks in Florida and shot in LA. I mean, it was like over six months we were working on that film, and uh, and that's 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 pretty unusual for you know for. Uh, uh, for movies, especially nowadays, they want to get it done. But anyway, long story short, uh, they, the the marketing campaign for that was just a camouflage elephant butt. You know, the, the back of the elephant standing there, and th that was the movie poster, and it said Dumbo Drop. And you don't, and and then and you see the names. You got Ray Liotta, Danny Glover, Dennis Leary. You got this these great cat, but you don't see it. You, you know, it wasn't like the classic Disney movies where you see the movie in the poster. You know, you, you you can already go on the journey, on the adventure, with the poster alone. You're like, oh, I got it! I got to go here! I got to see this! And you didn't have that with the, with their marketing campaign at all. You look at you like, I don't get it. You know, if you had seen the elephant on the boat, you know, with the river going up, and you see an explosion here and some other stuff, you know what I mean? I, I think the movie would have would have been a huge, huge hit, but it came out and just flopped. I mean, it absolutely flopped. Uh, but that's another one. I think that, that Operation Dumbo Joe, I just loved that movie. I had so much fun working on it. And it's a great family, uh, you know, family uh, uh, friendly film. Um, uh, that's definitely, you know, one of the ones that's it, a lot of the movies that I've done, you know, the sci fi ones or movies of the week or whatever, they're all, all of them kind of get, you know, glossed over a little bit over time. Uh, but. Um, but some of the sci-fi movies that, that I've done have, have been a lot of fun, uh, you know, Sand Sharks, and, and uh, which was a sci-fi comedy. I was I, I produced on that as well. The director didn't want to make it a comedy. He wanted to, he wanted to make a serious movie about sharks that swim in the sand. Pretty cool sharks. That swim in the sand. I'm like, are you, I mean, look, you're, look what you're pitching here. <laughs> you know, if we can't laugh at this, we're we're in deep deep doo doo. And so uh, we, we kept it a comedy, and we just it was just a daily fight with this director. <laughs> he was constantly trying to sneak in direction, like, okay, let's do one a little bit more serious this time. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. In fact, it's going to be even weirder now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and that's say, the movie, it was, I think it was the most, uh, it was the most successful uh, shark movie next to Sharknado. Hmm. That's for, <laughs> for, for sci-fi channel. So, you know, it, it definitely went, um, went over well. And then there was another one called uh, Dragon Wasps that had some uh, some uh, some funny stuff <laughs> in it, which was great. Like, I had this, uh, uh, the, I had them restructure the story because the story was a little, it, it, was, it was a little far-fetched and, and they, you know, they were supposed to be like these, you know, these revolutionaries and all that. I was like, dude, just make them drug dealers. They live up in the mountains. Just make them drug dealers. They sell dope, you know, and and they don't want us around because that's where they grow their stuff and blah, blah, blah. You know, so, uh, and and then we, we came up with this shtick that the that the coca leaves, uh, the, the citrus, the kind of the citronella stuff in it, to the coca, it, it, the, the 
dragon wasps are repelled by it. You know, they don't like coca leaves and all of that. So that's what kind of, you know, uh, we so so we ended up lathering ourselves in coca paste <laughs> at one point to keep the dragon wasps away, and we're all like. <laughs> it was just, it was so hilarious. It was so, and we're supposed to be special forces guys. And so, <laughs> my buddy, who's and he's like, you think we could get in trouble for this? <laughs> he's like, I need some more paste. I need more paste. I'm like, you've had enough paste. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was very, very funny stuff. We had some. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, this gentleman. Yeah. Uh, it's just something I've really been curious about. Any celebrity, and obviously you are not guilty of this. But yeah, we yeah. Have, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. well, we live in a time where fans have been told to get a life, and you know we also Roseanne is no longer called Roseanne; it's the Connors. So, if so. you've 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 played in, jo in 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 genre, a lot of genre, if you happen to not be a fan of that genre, and you get into the interview and they say they ask you the questions like, "So, did you watch Star Trek as a kid?" You know. If you didn't, how do you keep from offending your public? Oh, I mean, fortunately for me, I, I I'm totally into it. I, you know, I, I love the genre. I love uh, I I love sci-fi. I love uh, uh, fantasy, um, and uh, I. But I I haven't really, to be honest, I haven't I haven't met a whole lot of actors who loathe mm -hmm. what. What job they're doing, and and if you're lucky enough to get into a genre type of show, it's way better than uh, than. I mean, if I had done one season on Grey's Anatomy, I wouldn't be doing. I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be going to conventions over in France and all over the world. You know, uh, appearing for Supernatural and Stargate because they don't they they don't want to meet somebody from Grey's Anatomy. As weird as it is, you can have a show that's that hugely successful, and when they go to these signings, their lines are empty. Nobody wants their autograph. <laughs> it's just, it's just because these conventions are about sci-fi, fantasy, and all of that. And I've seen it happen at, at, at some of the conventions, uh, you know, where they bring in a, a pretty big name actor from a show that's just not, you know, the the, the genre. And I've seen them just sit there with a dead cue all day. And you got somebody who did like a couple of episodes of Star Trek, and he's got, you know, he's yeah. playing a Klingon, you know, that everybody loved, and he's got a cue, you know, it's like, it's so strange. It's a, it's a, it's a bizarre world. Uh, and I'm, I, and I, I'm so blessed and fortunate that, that I got to, you know, get into that world a little bit because it, it's, uh, um, it has paid in dividends uh, the un, uh, completely unknown by me, you know, not in terms of financial, but just in terms of life experience, you know, coming to the conventions, getting to meet everybody and actually have these moments. Before Stargate, I never met anybody, you know what I mean? I didn't know, I, you know, I didn't get to have these kind of opportunities. Um, and, uh, and I love the travel as well. I really, I really enjoy traveling. And fortunately for me, uh, I, I'm, I'm more famous in Europe <laughs> than I am in the U.S. <laughs> so I get I get to go to Europe a lot for for conventions and stuff like that, and uh, and that I just I, you know I just love. I, I mean I can't the amount I, I forget how many countries I've been to. I forget how many cities I've been to now, all because of Stargate, you know. And I'm just like wow, what a what an even though I even though I, I of course I, I I'm a little bent out of shape that I didn't stay on the show longer. It doesn't matter what it's what what the gift that that show has given me in, in life experience has just been. Get all the oranges priceless. you want in Italy. All the oranges. You want. No one's going to tell me not to peel them. <laughs> but when you get on like social media and stuff, you're not like paranoid at every. You got to measure I don't, every word. You no, know, well, to be honest, people people know by now. Like I have a super thick skin, and I just don't give a crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so it doesn't matter. Even if so, if, when people get offended at me, I always respond back with something pleasant or something. You know what I mean? Like, you know, hey, I feel, you know, like, oh, I hated you in that. Yeah, I hated me in that too. <laughs> you know, something like that. You know, like, you know, it's like, you know, doing the opposite response instead of being offended by it. Oh, I got Because then, then what ends up happening is no comment after that. They don't come back. If you get offended, then they're like, ah, ah, ah. and then it becomes a, you know, one of those 
Twitter Twitter wars, you know. Yeah. You don't have to show up to every fight you're invited to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I have a lot of fun. I, I mean, my, my Twitter feed is pretty hilarious. Uh, I see these two on my Twitter feed a lot. We have, we're, 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 we're Twitter pals. Just a little bit. <laughs> and and, uh, and I have I have a I have a follower on there. I uh, but nobody knows who it is. But um, a, a number of years back. Uh, when I first started doing conventions, I didn't realize that most of the most of uh, of the fans of Supernatural and Stargate are cat people. I had no idea, <laughs> you know. And uh, and I'm not a, I'm not a cat person per se. You know, I don't mind cats, but I don't want to live with one. And that was really my only thing. And so it somehow it came up and it. And it turned into, oh, Corin hates cats. <laughs> and, and I started getting some blowback from people. You know, I'm like, no, I don't hate cats. I just don't want to live with them. You know, like, they're fine. And, uh, and so eventually somebody created a, uh, a, a fake account called Catsonemic, which, which is like my nemesis. It's a tabby cat. And, uh, and anytime I post photos or do things like that, the, 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 whoever this person is goes and manipulates the photo and makes my eyeballs hanging out and gives me like a weird little wobbly belly button and all this crazy stuff. And they're truly embarrassing, like truly, truly degrading and embarrassing stuff. And, uh, and anybody else, I think, would be grossly offended by most of them. In fact, when Katsonemic first started, the, the, whoever it is had to go through several accounts because they kept getting suspended because other people were offended. I wasn't. But, but other people who follow me were offended and they reported Katso. And I'm like, and so they got shut down and like had to start back up again. And now, I mean, it's just hilarious. So I have this, uh, yeah, I have this ongoing sort of. Uh, 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 touche thing with this Katso Nemec character, whoever it is. Um, I have I have an inkling of who it might be. Uh, it's a, the, but it's a, it's a, a little crazy French lady, a little, a little nutty. Uh, um, but uh, I, I think it might be this person. I but I have I, I haven't done any uh, any any real investigative work to try and and suss it out. I like the mystery. A lot of people thought it was me. <laughs> and I'm like, do I have that much time to harass myself? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so I have a, I have a good time on you know on the social media. I don't take things too seriously. I try to keep things loose and uh, uh, you know the the platform. You know anybody who goes on Twitter, it's such a it's, pardon my French, but it's such a shit show. I mean, if you go in there and you start engaging in that and you start taking stuff seriously, oh, you are in for it. I mean, you are in for it. You might as well call the psychiatrist now <laughs> because you're going to need one, and, you know. I got one. <laughs> I think we got time for one more question. Sure. There's someone over here. Uh, yeah, we can, we can go to you first. Okay. Um, I was kind of curious whenever you first started your acting career and everything like that, uh, was there any one actor or director or something that, that you really wanted to meet or even work with? Um, not so much specifically. I mean, the, the, the movie that, that inspired me to become an actor was the movie Goonies, which uh, my, my father is uh, in the film business. He's a production designer. Uh, he was an art uh, um, uh, set designer. And uh, uh, he, did, um, he did all this. The, he designed the entire ship and the whole cave and all that stuff. And so... You know, uh, he he just had told me that like I'm gonna this film is gonna change my life, and it did. You know, so when I when I saw it, I was like I, I understood because I I had been on sets before, I understood the dynamics of it. You know what you know what is a set, what is it being filmed, and all that, and and uh, and when I saw that, I was like I want to do that. I want to live that adventure. I know that it's fake. I know you're run, but that's the coolest thing ever. You know, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and that's really what uh, what inspired me to, to pursue acting was uh, was that movie, was the movie Goonies. Uh, and me and Sean Astin are buddies, which is really which is cool. <laughs> He's a great guy. Um, I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, yep. unfortunately. That's all right. I know. So I'm going to ask if you guys would you just stand at the end of the room down there? Yes, of course. I well, know, I will. I just, yeah, I'm going to say I'm going to look at. Oh, oh yes. Okay. <laughs> Where do you want us? Down at the end of the room, and the rest of you look.